I did not attend the sentencing hearing yesterday before Judge Thunheim. I didn't ask for it, but someone was kind enough to forward the transcript to me. I read it last night at home with my wife nearby as I sat next to my nine-year-old son as he played Xbox. I can tell you I've hugged my son a lot harder since I began working on this case. I've never met the Wetterlings or their children, but I feel like I know them. Don't we all feel like we know them or that in some sense as Minnesotans they've become part of our families? The victim impact statements of Trevor, Amy, and Carmen moved me to tears. And this was something I just read. I didn't attend the, the hearing. And they were as heartfelt as any I've ever heard or read in my 30 years as an attorney. What wonderful adults they, have, adults they have become, and we have no doubt Jacob would have turned out the same way. And Aaron Larson, you don't need to feel guilty anymore. It wasn't your fault. It was all because of an evil man named Heinrich. Aaron's statement was equally heartfelt and moving as, as Jacob's siblings. But I felt in the words of these four adults frustration, that was my sense, like tens of thousands in Stearns County and millions of Minnesotans that this guy Heinrich is the confessed but not convicted sexual assaulter of Jared Shirell and the confessed, confessed but not convict, convicted murderer of Jacob Wetterling. No sensible person can be happy about that reality. Why is this? Knowing this is important to understanding what happened to Dan Rassier and what is still happening to Ryan Larson. So it's important for us to be able to figure that out. We are here to tell you this reality is not the fault of, and by reality I mean the fact that Heinrich is the confessed but not convicted sexual assaulter and murderer of those two young men. It's not the fault of the FBI. It's not the fault of a U.S. attorney, Mr. Luger. It's not the fault of the two able attorneys who represented the government in its case against Heinrich, and it's certainly not the fault of the Wetterlings. It happened because of the conduct of a few people in two agencies and the Stearns County District, District Attorney who was in place before Ms. Kendall. I'm not speaking of Janelle Kendall, I'm talking about the DA who was in place before her. I will explain that further in a few minutes. I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, the folks that are up here, I'm Mike Patton, I represent Dan Rassier. And Dan's name is a little hard to pronounce. The, the way you can think about it is think of Brass E. Year. Is that right, Dan? Think of Brass and then Year, Brass Year. Okay. Brass Year. And I, I butcher his name all the time, but that, that's how his name is pronounced. This, of course, is Dan. To Dan's uh, left is Steve Rogers, who's my investigator for this case and has done a huge amount of work with the work we've uncovered. And, as a predicate to the lawsuit we will be filing. To my right is Devin Jacob, Ryan Larson's attorney. I just met Devin yesterday. He's a very well-known uh, national civil rights attorney from Pennsylvania. He'll be speaking after me. And then, of course, Ryan Larson to, to Devin's right. Um, the format of this is I will have some comments to say. I think I'll be about 20 minutes. I don't think it'll, if it's longer than that, it won't be much longer. Mr. Jacob will have some comments, and then we will open it up to Q&A if any of you have questions. Also, I, I'm willing to stay, I, I think Devin is too, when we're done, if you want to speak with us individually. I have a little bit of a time constraint. I'm an assistant basketball coach for my nine-year-old's uh, nine basketball team, so I, I don't want to miss that. But I can stay for a while if you folks want any one-on-one. -on -one. In not all circumstances are we going to be able to answer every question you may have. Um, a lot of it we can answer because there's obviously some people who have been sources for us that at this time don't want to reveal who they are. And this is very common in civil litigation, especially in a case like this that's high profile. I guess you could think of it as a type of thing where you may have a source and you aren't able to reveal it. So I think for the most part we can tell you what the sources of our information are and I will go into that in my, my prepared comments. Um, the primary players to date that we claim violated Mr. Rassier's rights are the Stearns County Sheriff's Office, which I'll refer to in this presentation as SCSO, Sheriff John Sanner, Captain Pam Jensen, who is now retired, the, Bureau, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, BCA agent Ken McDonald, and others who were involved in 1990 that we claim thwarted the investigation back in 1990. That's a significant point I'll be making in a few moments here. If anyone, including former law enforcement, have information relevant to these two matters, and well, actually, I, Jared Shirell case, 
the Jacob Wetterling case and anything regarding Ryan Larson and Dan Rassier, we would respectfully request that you contact us. We have our contact information in the, uh, on the screen up above. And uh, we would really appreciate if anybody has information that's helpful to our cases that you reach out to us. And to be frank, that's one of the reasons why we're having this press conference, is to reach out to the public. We're especially interested in people in Stearns County that may feel they've been, the, been violated in any way or treated improperly by Sheriff Sander or any representative of, the, of SCSO. Um, the reason and the only reason that Dan's case has not yet been sued out, the complaint is essentially completed, but the reason that we haven't commenced suit yet is because of the document dump that is perhaps commenced now due to the fact that Heinrich is now uh, sentenced. Um, we did not want to have a situation where we, we start a lawsuit and then 30 days, or, and 30 days later we're amending our complaints. So we felt it was appropriate to, to hold off on that and our timing will be, we, we feel confident we'll have this case sued out before the, before the beginning of next year, before December 31st. And uh, we do want to see what, what is in those documents, and we're very, frankly, very excited to see what is in those documents. Having said that, a lot has been released that is very helpful to us, including, for example, the fact that a Stearns County judge forced SCSO to, re to release warrants in 2015. And of course, the government's documents have been very helpful to understanding what this case is about. We feel that the evidence we have to date is very strong and for, for supports a very strong cause of action on behalf of Mr. Rassier against four primary entities, SCSO, Sheriff John Sanner, the BCA, and Agent Ken McDonald. We feel that Captain Pam Jensen, she's retired, that she has some involvement too, but we are, are not actually naming her as a party, but certainly any conduct of hers the SCSO would be responsible for that under the, the legal concept of responding out superior. Folks, this case is strange for me in the sense that over the years I've had many cases that have garnered media attention. I've had high profile cases over the years, just kind of the nature, I, I guess, of the kind of law I practice. And in the past when a reporter has sought information from me, you know, the lawyer is typically providing detail to assist the reporter with ascertaining the facts and then perhaps commenting on a particular legal concept. But I found out quickly in this case with, with media that I've dealt with and just speaking with them, and I don't want to leave the false impression that I've gone to, sit to any, any reporter and said, hey, can you help me with this case and give me information? But the point I want to make is it's amazing to me in this case how media, not just in, in the Twin Cities but outstate media and, and in Stearns County, the detailed, intimate knowledge you have as a press corps on this case. I've never seen anything like it, and I think it's probably just the, the nature of this case, and, and I think it probably has been difficult for you over the years because, you know, to try to get information out of the investigating authorities is difficult. And, you know, what do you report if you don't have information of substance? Um, so, I quickly learned that anything Wetterling is huge news, and when the story broke the St. Cloud Times, Dave Unzi broke the story of the fact that I represented Dan, I guess I was a little naive in not realizing how, how big just the fact that he hired an attorney would be. The AP picked up the story, and it's been a firestorm ever since. Uh, so we felt it was important uh, with the, the interest in the case also to have this press conference, just kind of lay out some basic information about the case and why we feel that, that this is a viable case from a civil rights perspective. Um, there's no question in my mind that the Jacob Wetterling investigation and the circumstances of Jacob's abduction is the highest profile criminal case in state history. Perhaps that could be argued, but the fact that, that fact that it's the highest profile criminal case in, in state history, and for good reason, I'm glad it's the highest a profile criminal uh, case in state history is important to understanding about what eventually happened to this man to my left, Dan Rassier, and the man to my right, Ryan Larson. I'd like to tell you a couple comments about my knowledge of the case and, you know, as a Twin Cityan and a lawyer who's practiced his whole career in the Twin Cities. I was 28 years old and lived in downtown Minneapolis when Jacob was abducted. I had been a Minnesota attorney for just over three years. Where I lived downtown, I could walk to the Metrodome, and the first season of the Minnesota Timberwolves, the entire inaugural season, was at the Metrodome, as some of, some of you may recall. And I remember distinctly the very first game that year that there was discussion that Timberwolves were kind enough 
on behalf of the Wetterling family to point out the fact that their son was missing and that they were reaching out to the public to see if they could find him, understandably. But as time went on and as years went by, and I speak to you not so much as, a, as an attorney, but as a typical Twin Cityan, the perception was, and the common perception, I think you folks would agree with me, those of you from the Twin Cities, was that Jacob was dead, that the case would never be solved, and that it was quite possible that Jacob's abductor was dead, especially since the first composite that appeared made the guy look like he was 55 to 60 years old. I think in retrospect we realized that was a big mistake to do that. So in 1999, if you assume the guy's 60 years old, he would be 70 years old. So I think it's reasonable to understand why people thought that it was entirely possible that the perpetrator was dead. The other significant belief, and this is very important, that there was no evidence of substance about this abduction other than the two boys seeing a masked man and the man taking, taking Jacob away. Um, and this was the perception also not just of citizens in the Twin Cities, this was the perception of lawyers, I know many lawyers, and it was also the perception of law enforcement. In terms of documents for us, like I say, we've been able to obtain a lot of information and more information is coming in daily. We've gotten tremendous help in that regard. But what was important for us, and Mr. Rogers will confirm this, were the warrant documents, as I mentioned before, that SCSO was forced to produce, and the government's filings. Folks, the government's filings, if you want to understand this case, perhaps the best source of information is the government's brief. It's a 46-page brief opposing Heinrich's motion to suppress evidence and for change of venue. That's a very important document that will help you understand what this case is about and the history of it. And also the affidavit of Shane Ball, the FBI agent who had the primary duty when the FBI re-engaged in 2014 to try to solve this case, to have fresh eyes look at it. Um, we had early hypotheses and, and as we, about this case and as this proceed, pr proceeded forward in terms of our investigation, it seemed like they were confirmed each and every time we obtained more information. An important source was news stories. And I've always contended that news stories can be important sources of information, especially the fact that news stories contain quotations from people that the media has spoke with. Um, you know, my impression, I've always had a good relationship with the media. 30 years I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever been burned by a member of the media. When I see a story and I see a quotation from, from a witness, or a, you know, in that case a source for a story, I generally have found that that's going to be 100% accurate. And I think that's the case here when you look at the history of the coverage in this case. And, and excellent media, not, not just in the Twin Cities, but in, in Stearns County. Um, I think the, the coverage of this case has been quality from the beginning. I want to make clear, too, that in Dan's case, there's no question that members of the media could be witnesses. Um, I'm not going to explain how that is, but I think it will be readily apparent to you as I, as I make my comments. Uh, other sources that were helpful to us, the books of Robert Dudley, the second and third edition, were very helpful and the contents, as far as we were concerned, were, were always accurate when compared to other sources. I mean, in a case like this, you consume everything you can. And to have a book that has a nice chronological presentation of, of what went on, Mr. Rogers will tell you and I will tell you, it was really helpful to us. Madeline Barron, she's a rock star. You know, for people who believe in truth, justice, and honor, owe her a debt, a debt of excuse me, a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. I think people in Minnesota love investigative journalism. I know it's hard because the, just the task of, of obtaining the news and reporting the news is, is cumbersome. I know that. Um, it seems like, especially in the last 10 years, it seems like the amount of news we have generating out of the Twin Cities is has just increased tenfold. I have no idea why that is, but I understand that. I've been practicing law for 30 years and I've learned that one immutable fact about human beings is that they are capable of almost anything. And certainly, law enforcement is not immune from this reality as we learn from making a murderer, which is, a, is, is the Wisconsin version of, of the In the Dark podcast as far as I'm concerned. After we began, we jumped in deep. I called Devin, and I didn't know Devin, but I had to get personal affirmation as to what I was seeing because it was shocking me. 
especially in light of the fact that this myth was perpetuated that there was no evidence, no evidence in this case, and that, folks, was a myth. And certainly his case is a different one than mine, but I was happy to get his feedback, and as we went forward, it seemed that I wasn't looking at a mirage. This stuff was actually true. I had a lot of sleepless nights, I want to tell you, since I started working on this case. I felt early on that there was a symbiotic relationship with Dan's case and Ryan's case. How? Well, you got two innocent people that law enforcement tried to pin a murder on. That's one way. I first met Devin yesterday, and I want to make clear that although our cases have similarities, they are separate cases. They will be litigated separately and filed separately. I want to now address my comments to Stearns County Sheriff John Sanner. Sheriff, you stood up there at Heinrich's plea hearing and you accepted praise from Andy Luger that wasn't deserved. We want to ask you if these contentions that we are about to make, and I'm about to say, whether in your opinion they are true. And then we have some questions for you, Sheriff. And when I say we, I'm speaking in terms of me, Dan, and Steve. I, I'm not necessarily speaking uh, on behalf of Ryan and, and Devin. I want to make clear that what we're about to say is not a criticism of all members of law enforcement. I know that many members of law enforcement worked tire, tirelessly to try to solve Jacob's case. I know that. I mean, they worked long hours, they didn't sleep, they were hardly eating, and they spent weeks committed to trying to solve this, this young, young boy's uh, crime. For example, the MPD officer who was brought to the scene with his canine <coughs> unit the day after Jacob was abducted did a great job and confirmed 100% that Jacob was taken away by a motor vehicle. This, uh, this officer by the name was Don Bannon, who I believe is now retired. I'm confident that members of law enforcement statewide will be offended as we are with what happened here, including, we hope, current and former members of SCSO and the DCA. Sheriff Sanders, this is what we have found out. We want to ask you if this is true. Number one, after Jared was abducted and sexually assaulted, and I speak of Jared Shiro, and folks, normally I would not mention a, a boy as a sexual assault victim, but I think you all know that Jared came public years ago, and his name is well known to us. In fact, his, his picture was on the front page of the paper today uh, and reporting the comments he made after <coughs> Heinrich was sentenced. Jared Shiro was, Shiro was abducted and sexually assaulted on January 13, 1989. The SCSO in 1989 locked in on Daniel James Heinrich. But after observing his car, which was a smart thing to do at his workplace based on the excellent description that Jared gave of the interior of that vehicle, about a month later, nothing happened regarding Heinrich until after Jacob was abducted, and that was not until December of 1989. So they didn't follow up on Heinrich until approximately two months after, after Jacob was abducted. The FBI, with hard, solid work, not only developed strong evidence to tie Heinrich into the sexual assault of Jared in early 1990, but also importantly concluded that there was a connection between Jared's assault and Jacob's abduction. That connection was made, ladies and gentlemen, in early 1990. The FBI progressed well in January of 1990 and had developed a mountain of evidence, mountain of evidence tying in Heinrich to Jared's assault. Regarding Jacob's abduction, there were positives in that regard, too. They had footprints and tire tracks from the Rassier driveway. And those prints were ultimately determined to be a match, which, of course, connected Heinrich physically to the abduction scene. But conflict developed. We believe that there was interagency jealousy, and the conflict was between SCSO, the BCA, the Stearns, Stearns County DA's office versus the FBI. It appears, and we're going to work very hard to get more detail on this, but it appears that the primary source of conflict concerned the timing of the interview of one Daniel James Heinrich. So because of that, there was anger, and unfortunately, and it's the kind of thing that probably falls in the category you can't make it up, Heinrich not only escaped the net, 
He was then insulated for 25 and a half years. The district attorney then was a guy by the name of Roger Van Heel. Now he's deceased, but he was the individual that we reasonably believe had the evidence and decided not to charge Heinrich. Fortunately, in 2014, the FBI re-engaged. There were four important predicate factors, and this came from the public, not from law enforcement. Four important predicate factors that led, that helped the FBI to solve the case. And they were one, the respectful request of Patty and, and Jerry for the FBI to re-engage, that certainly was important. The dissemination of the so-called heart notes, the Dwayne Hart notes by Robert Dudley to Shane Ball. And Dudley, when he disseminated those notes, actually mentioned and emphasized Heinrich. The heart notes, of course, emphasized Heinrich as a possible suspect. The courage of Jared Shiro to come forward before 2014 and shout off of a mountaintop his belief that his molester was responsible for both his assault and Jacob's abduction. And four, the courage and hard work of Joy Baker to get that message out along with the contention of the link, the important link between the Painesville assaults in the late 80s uh, to Jared's case and Jacob's case. There is no question, by the way, that the chief of, the chief of police of Painesville did tell SCSO about the Painesville assaults, but the prime FBI agent assigned to the case has stated unequivocally that the FBI knew nothing about the Painesville assaults when they were investigating in 1990. There was help from the media also, people like Esme Murphy, which helped get the message of, of Joy and, and Jared out there. Esme, of course, is with CBS. From 2014 to 2016, due to the efforts of the FBI, both cases were solved. But for the interference of Minnesota local law enforcement agencies, and the unfortunate decision of D.A. Van Heel not to charge, Heinrich could have been brought to justice back in 1989, but certainly not later than 1990. We feel strongly that the hero for the FBI in this case is a guy by the name of Shane Ball, Agent Shane Ball, although we reasonably assume that he had a team of people helping him. His affidavit that contained the language, and, and I'm not sure if this is from his affidavit or was a government brief, but in essence, what he said was he could not understand why Heinrich was no longer considered a suspect. Doesn't that tell you a lot about this case? We predict that millions of Minnesotans are going to see the same thing when they see the evidence that he saw. I've often thought of myself when Mr. Rogers and I have worked on this case, the shock that we saw from the evidence was probably mirrored from the shock that Shane Ball saw when he, when he looked at the evidence himself. I mean, yeah. Folks, we'll show you. You need look no further than the sole of the shoe of Danny Heinrich and the print that was left on the driveway. We'll show you that in a little while. Sheriff Sander became the sheriff in 2003. Beginning in 2004, he, along with SCSO Captain Pam Jensen and BC agent Ken McDonald, converted an important witness, Dan, into a suspect with a so-called abduction on foot theory. This was based on, as you folks probably all know, a witness named Kevin. So what they did was they took 15 years of investigation where every single investigator who was involved in the case had opined that Jacob was taken by car and created this new theory. Although no evidence, zero evidence, was developed between 2004 and 2010 which implicated Dan which was obvious since he was innocent, a warrant from, from a Stearns County judge, which in part was obtained by fraudulent means and then proceeded with a high profile digging event. BCA agent Ken McDonald actually told the judge in question that Dan was the subject of an Interpol investigation, which was a bald face lie. Sander named Dan a person of interest in 2010. He came right out and named him publicly. And that was the first time in the entire history of the case a person had been named a person of interest. We claim the abduction on foot theory was a false, bogus theory from the beginning with no competent factual support whatsoever. Basically, folks, it was nothing but a legal gimmick. Why did Sander do this? It's our theory 
It's our theory. We plan to prove that this man was under a lot of pressure. It was a way for him to convince the public something of substance was happening on Jacob's case, and that would obviously assist him with getting reelected and take the heat off of him. But secondly, we strongly believe that it was retribution against Dan for the fact that he noted to others that he thought law enforcement had blown the investigation. He additionally articulated those opinions in 2009 to Patty Wetterling, and Patty Wetterling at the time was wired. He had no idea she was wired, but obviously law enforcement would have heard those comments. Sheriff Sander, we have some questions for you. We'd like you to answer. Now that the case is closed, and you can't dodge questions like this anymore with the, the so-called ongoing investigation label that you've given people for years. Now that it's over, these are the questions we have. Number one, were you aware that, uh, that as of 2004, Master Re Mr. Rassier had worked with conservatively 10,000 boys from music instruction in school and private le lessons without one allegation of inappropriate conduct by a student or parent before you and your people began to point the finger at him that year? And to date, that number now exceeds 14,000 boys, and there still have been no complaints. Were you aware of that, Sheriff? Two, why did the investigation of Heinrich regarding Jared stop in February of 1989 and not recommence until 1289, about two months after Jacob's abduction? And Sheriff, if you give the answer that it didn't stop, and I have a feeling you might give that answer, please tell us, please tell not only me and Mr. Jacob, but the public, because the public deserves answers. What was done of substance between 215 and 89 and 10-22-89 when Jacob was abducted. Three, if Jared Shiro was a son of a member of law enforcement, would Jared's case have been pursued more aggressively rather than what happened? Four, wasn't the fact that Heinrich wasn't charged before Jacob's abduction and then not charged in 1990 after Jacob's abduction in 1989 a mistake for those mistakes? Can we have someone admit that those were mistakes? And Sheriff, we're giving you the opportunity. Wasn't your abduction on foot theory a theory for which there was no concrete evidence from the beginning, Sheriff? Wasn't it a mistake to first pursue Dan in 2004 and then again in 2010? Sheriff, don't you feel apologies are in order for Mr. Rassier and Mr. Larson? Next. Isn't it true that every investigator before you developed your theory, 15 years worth, felt that Jacob was taken away from, from the abduction site with a car, which, by the way, folks, we now know that did happen. Wasn't the work by MPD officer Don Bannum and his K-9 unit solid to support the contention of abduction by car? Next question. Weren't the tennis shoe prints and tire prints such that Heinrich was clearly linked by physical evidence to the crime? Did you ever look at that evidence yourself before you began finger pointing at an innocent man? Is it a true statement, Sheriff, that when publicity developed linking the Painsville assaults to Jared's assault and Jacob's abduction, that you engaged in a concerted effort with the media to downplay the link? Isn't that true, Sheriff? Next question. Before you began with the finger pointing against Dan in 2004, were you aware that Dan had a lock? solid alibi for Jared's assault on 113.89. And were you additionally aware, Sheriff, that Jared was adamant that Dan Rassier was not the person who abducted and sexually assaulted him? And Sheriff, I have this last question for you. One more thing. In 2004, you began to say and claim that Dan Rassier abducted Jacob with a gun, sexually assaulted him, killed him, and then apparently disposed of Jacob's body on his property. Sheriff, why would a man call 911 that night with the intent of having law, law enforcement come to his property if he had done all of those things? Steve, I think at this time I'd like to show the folks the footprint evidence, if we could, please. The images we're about to show you were taken from an affidavit of a law enforcement official, and it shows the... It's a picture of the soul of, this, is a, this shot here, folks, is the actual shoe itself here. And as you can see, it has a very distinctive pattern. 
And then if you look at the prints here, you can see, I think it's very clear that that shoe made those prints. You can see the distinctive pattern is in the images. And by the way, the FBI did confirm there was a match and also confirmed that the size of that print and that soil was the same as that shoe. Now, to be fair, they didn't say it was an exact scientific match, but this is enough. This is the kind of evidence that juries look at every day in this country, every single day. And this evidence would, would have been admitted if Heinrich was charged with Jacob's abduction. You can take that image down now, Steve. Sheriff, you have my email address. I know you're on vacation this week. God bless you. You're a hardworking man. Everybody deserves to have a vacation. But it would be greatly appreciated if you could email those responses in the next two or three weeks, or perhaps you could disseminate the answers through the media. And the comments I'm making today, this is a prepared text, Sheriff. I'll be happy to email you the exact questions. And I'll, I'll, I'll do that to your email address. If you want me to circumvent that through Ms. Kendall or some other source, I'm happy to do that. So I'm happy to submit the questions in writing to you. Thank you, folks. I'm going to now pass the baton, baton to Mr. Jacob. Thank you. Um, before I get into the heart of this, I want to say um, that I am former law enforcement. I was a police officer, um, defended law enforcement for 10 years. I was a deputy attorney general in Pennsylvania for a couple of years. And now, for the last five years, I've been doing civil rights litigation on the plaintiff's side and the last three nationally. So I've been all over these cases. I've been on the street as a police officer. Um, I feel for the Decker family as to what happened uh, on the night in question. And so does Ryan Larson. Um, it's never easy when an officer is hurt, certainly never easy when an officer is murdered, serving the citizens. And Officer Decker's family, I'm sure, is hurting and will always hurt for the rest of, of their lives. And the family deserves closure, as does the community, along with Mr. Larson. But because of, of the theory that's been put out there, that this case must remain open, there's been no closure. The, the case has remained open, stringing the family along of the police officer who died, leading them to believe that there's still a chapter that has yet to be written. And we know that's not true. And the reason the, the investigation remains open is pretty clear. And that's because it can be. It can be because there's no statute of limitations for the crime of murder. Therefore, it's allowed to be left open. And if it's left open, nothing gets released to the public. It's that simple. It is an effort to not be transparent about what happened on a night in a small town, 4,000 people, when an officer was murdered. And what we know happened from the, just the little evidence that has trickled out publicly is that investigators absolutely and completely botched this investigation. They targeted on the wrong individual, Mr. Larson, who we know definitively was not involved in this crime. And now they don't want it to come out what they did because if it comes out what happened, then people start losing jobs, people start losing political careers, and obviously self-interest prevails. But I think it's time, after all this time, that self-interest be put aside and the taxpayers, frankly, realize that what has happened is not only a, a travesty to, to the officer's family and to the community, but it's going to cost a lot of money now to make Mr. Larson whole, and Mr. Rassier whole. And if the municipalities choose to defend these cases for which there is no defense, it's going to cost significantly more. There comes a time when we just need to cut our losses and realize that people have been wronged and harmed. And make things right and move on. 
And yes, there are certain people who are involved in this case, in Mr. Larson's case, and presumably in Mr. Rassier's case, who should never have had the jobs that they had, who were not trained to do the jobs that they were asked to do, and should not be continuing in their capacities as serving the public. Because they're not serving the public, they're serving themselves. It has been reported that on the night in question, Officer Ryder was asked to check on the welfare of Mr. Larson. Now, he was referred to as suicidal on the night in question, but in actuality, there was no evidence indicating that he was suicidal. He had made comments purportedly in the past that had concerned family, and family had asked that officers go check on the welfare simply because they could not get in touch with him that night. And they couldn't get in touch with him because he had turned his phone off and had gone to sleep. Many of us have done that. But from that fact, we heard about a suicidal individual, and Mr. Larson's been painted as this horrible person that needed to be checked on that night, it was very dangerous, when in fact, he was a guy who went home, turned off his phone, and went to sleep. And a concerned mother reached out and said, could you check on my child? <coughs> Mr. Larson was fine that night. Mr. Larson was sleeping that night. I spoke to an eyewitness who says that at 6 o'clock and still at 9 o'clock, Mr. Larson's vehicle was sitting where it was sitting the entire time in the parking lot to the rear of Winter's Sports Bar and Grill. The vehicle never moved, so where it was reported that it wasn't there when Officer Ryder arrived is curious, to say the least. Because again, an eyewitness puts it there. Two eyewitnesses actually put it there. Officer Ryder claims that when Officer Decker exited his vehicle and began to walk towards Mr. Larson's uh, apartment, that that's when the shooting occurred. And it's my understanding that despite having called a backup police officer down to the scene, that Officer Ryder remained in his vehicle. And that once the shooting occurred, Officer Ryder did not get out and pursue the suspect who he claimed had proceeded away from the scene, away from the building where Mr. Larson was sleeping. He didn't pursue him, and in fact, he fled the location. And he fled the location while Officer Decker was lying on the ground dying. Mr. Larson was still home sleeping. He didn't know any of this was going on. But for some reason, suspicion turned to Mr. Larson, which is very curious considering two independent eyewitnesses, Officer Ryder being one and a citizen being another, reported that the suspect was seen leaving the scene shortly after the shooting. Officer Ryder himself reported the suspect leaving the scene on foot, and the citizen reported seeing a loud, dark-colored van leaving the area as well. Now, there's a time difference between the two reports, which certainly, based on the location that, that the, they put both the van and the suspect, makes it appear that it's one and the same. So all indications when officers were arriving to investigate the shooting was that a shooting had occurred, coincidentally, in the location where there had been a call prior, several hours before in the evening, and that the suspect had fled the area. But with that information, somehow, for some reason, the focus became Mr. Larson. And of course I asked, why? Nobody's ever answered the question, why are you focused on Mr. Larson? And if you think about it, it's a really good question. You literally have nothing other than the mere coincidence that several hours earlier, there had been a mother who asked to check on her child at a property, and several hours later, an officer is killed by somebody leaving the scene. But Mr. Larson, who's sleeping in his apartment, is now the prime suspect. CERT team surrounded the property. Mr. Larson's inside sleeping. CERT team decided to force their way into Mr. Larson's apartment. Mr. Larson's sleeping. Now this is very important. 
This is a very important point because the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution says that in order to enter someone's home, you need a warrant or you need consent or you need probable cause and exigent circumstances. Warrant, consent, or probable cause and exigent circumstances. Not only did they not have probable cause connecting Mr. Larson to this horrible crime, but they didn't have exigent circumstances either. If you think about it, tragically, Officer Decker was now deceased. The property's completely surrounded. There is no exigency requiring them to go through that door with rifles and wake Mr. Larson and pull him from his bed. So just looking at it from that standpoint, Mr. Larson's federal civil rights were violated as soon as the officers went through that door. And it's not a defense that they were following an unlawful order. You don't get to say, well, my boss told me to do so. Once they're inside, there's another requirement, and that's that there be probable cause to arrest. So crossing the threshold is one issue. But just because you're standing there doesn't mean you get to arrest everybody inside. The Fourth Amendment says that you must have probable cause that the person that you're arresting committed a crime. And the question is, well, what does probable cause mean? Well, it's actually a, a, a relatively easy definition in that it's one, that probably a crime occurred, and two, that the person that you're arresting probably committed that crime. I think we've already gone over the fact that there is zero, zero evidence linking this crime to Mr. Larson at that point in time and subsequently. So they unlawfully enter his apartment with rifles pointed at him, and then they take him into custody unlawfully for a crime that he didn't commit. There was not even reasonable suspicion, let alone probable cause, at that time that Mr. Larson was involved. Subsequently, Mr. Larson was taken from his property. He was told, we're not going to tell you why we're taking you. The CERT team reported to the incident commander, to my understanding through my sources, that they had made numerous entries into numerous properties, but they were pretty certain that Mr. Larson was not faking, that he was, in fact, asleep when they came through that door. And he asked, why am I in handcuffs? What is going on? Truly having no idea what was going on and was not told. They said, we'll tell you when you get me downtown. He's shirtless. He's paraded out of his apartment in handcuffs in the middle of the night. He's taken downtown, and he is interrogated by Captain Pam Jensen and investigator Kenneth McDonald. Can you ring a bell? He's interrogated for almost six hours, shown pictures of Officer Decker's injuries and body, and asked, why did you do it? He had to ask him before they showed him the pictures, do what? Because he didn't even know why he was sitting there. Could you imagine? This could be anybody in this room. This could be anybody's child in this room. This could be anybody's family member. This was, let's pin it on the neighbor. Sound familiar? This could literally be anybody in this room who is yanked out of their bed and told you just killed a police officer. Six hours, he had to look at these pictures and be told he should cooperate, be told he should just be a man and admit what he did. That works on you, especially when you have family, when you have a mother, a father, when you have siblings who you know are hearing about this who you can't speak to. When you have a son, and you know he's going to hear about this. When you have friends 
to know that you were just ripped out of your bed and now the apartment accused of killing a police officer when there's only 4,000 in a town where it gets around pretty quick. He's given a smock and he's strip searched. And he's told you can wear that smock because you're suicidal. And he's put in a small cell alone for five days. The window's blocked over, no sunlight. One hour a day he gets to come out. He's called Cop Killer. He was given a phone book to read as a joke because he's a cop killer for entertainment. He was not treated well while he was in there. And this is the part of the story that you know, nobody really thought to think about what was happening to him. He got to make one phone call a day. And so, of course, he used them carefully. He called mom, of course, first. And then he calls dad. Then he called the media. And that's because he wanted help. And you guys did give him help. You, you got his story out there. And he appreciates that. And you've been looking into his story. And Mr. Larson really appreciates that as well. Um, you've really done your homework in this case. You've really done your homework in uh, the Waterland case, Mr. Rassier's case. Um, it's been noticed. It doesn't always happen. Um, and it's, it's commendable. Uh, we're doing an important job here trying to litigate these cases once they're filed and investigating, making sure we do our due diligence before they're filed. But the media pay plays a huge, huge important role in our society. So it's my little, my little speech to the aside um, in that regard. There was an affidavit that was filed. Um, it's called an application for judicial determination of probable cause to detain. That's a, that's a mouthful there. Um, it was filed by a Sergeant Timothy J. Desmarius. I could be pronouncing his name wrong, and I apologize to him. And Deputy Stephen P. Lemkul. And I could be Lemkul. We go back and forth on the pronunciation, so I apologize as well. The affidavit is signed by both officers. That affidavit is a sworn affidavit that is sent along with the application uh, in order to detain, uh, once the person's arrested, to detain him for a longer period of time. Now, normally when there's been a, a, a warrant or something, a document of this nature, and the judge signs off on it, normally that insulates police officers from liability. Um, and when a district attorney signs off on it, as in this case occurred again, normally that insulates uh, the officers from liability but there's an exception and that's when there's been uh, false or misleading statements that have been placed in the affidavit of probable cause or when there's um, been material pieces of information excluded from the affidavit of probable cause the question is the question that the courts will look at is would a independent neutral judicial officer want to know the information, the correct information, or the missing information in determining whether or not there's probable cause and making that determination. And if, through the manner in which the affidavit is drafted, it, it's interfered with the discretion of the district attorney or of the court, it no longer insulates the individuals from liability. And this affidavit is, is, is very troubling, frankly, when you read it. And I think just from um, what I told you today, you can already tell why. The affidavit um, states that for officer safety, uh, Mr. Larson was asked, where's the gun when the officers came through the door? Now, as a former police officer, I know why those words were in there. It's not by mistake. Officer safety would be an exception to needing to read somebody their rights. Uh, during the course of an investigation. You can ask for officer safety, where's the bomb? Where's the gun? Where's whatever? So they were going for what they thought was a, a murder weapon or attempting to go for a, a, a dangerous weapon, a key piece of evidence, but not wanting to read the rights to Mr. Larson. Um, when you put that in the document and when it, when it says that Mr. Larson told them it's under my pillow, the implication is, where's the gun? It's under my pillow that we're talking about the murder weapon. That's very misleading. And that's, 
that's not how an affidavit of probable cause is supposed to be written. The affidavit fails to indicate that two shotgun shells were found at the scene on the night in question and that the wounds were consistent with having been shot with a shotgun. That's very material information that a judicial officer would want to know, especially considering there were no shotguns located in Mr. Larson's property, a fact which was not included in the affidavit of probable cause. The affidavit provides that there was a hooded sweatshirt located in Mr. Larson's bedroom that matched the description provided by Officer Ryder. There's no indication that Officer Ryder ever looked at the sweatshirt and confirmed it, and there's no description of the sweatshirt and no description of what the description was that Officer Ryder purportedly provided to law enforcement. A dark sweatshirt with a hood is hardly a description. And interestingly, um, and this was a piece that was just discovered last night as we continue to peruse and go over the evidence, things continue to, to jump out of you. You'll actually hear the 911 dispatch on the radio communications put out over the radio that there's no description, no clothing description. Yet somehow they came up with a clothing description and had it in the affidavit of probable cause. The affidavit fails to mention that Mr. Larson's hands were swabbed for gunshot residue. I would think if I was a judge and I was evaluating whether or not there's probable cause, I'd want to know that you swabbed the individual's hands and I'd want to know what that test said. Not only did they not tell him, but they didn't tell him that the test was negative. And the affidavit does not discuss the fact that Officer Ryder, there's a question about whether he timely reported the shooting, but did not pursue the suspect, did not render medical aid to Officer Decker, and fled the location. Now, if I was looking at this information and evaluating whether this individual should be held with literally no evidence, I'd want to know that there was another individual, a police officer, who was acting in a way that police officers don't act. Um, as a former police officer, I can say that you're not trained. It's, it's not pursuant to training and policy or training procedure to not pursue a suspect to flee a shooting scene and to not render medical care. So the fact that, that an individual has deviated from what is accepted standard practices and policies is certainly questionable. If anything, on the night in question, right after the shooting, there was evidence that pointed to Officer Ryder being involved in this, and I'm not saying he was, but just understand, on balance, there was evidence that at least put Officer Ryder under reasonable suspicion and there was nothing, literally nothing, that pointed to Mr. Larson. While Mr. Larson was being held, that was not all that was happening to him. The officers decided to go into his home, put holes in his walls, put holes in his floor, looking for stuff. They destroyed personal property. They took personal property, and to this day, this happened in 2012, to this day, Mr. Larson's property has not been returned. Stearns County actually went into court when Mr. Larson tried to get his property back a few years after, and initially the judge said, you need to return the property, and Stearns County asked to have what we call an in-camera review. It's a, a closed door with the judge, and within seconds came out and after telling them, telling the judge something, suddenly the property could, could continue to be held. Well, it's time we tell Mr. Larson what it was that was said in camera that convinced a judge to continue to hold his property until today. And in that regard, yesterday I served the county, Stearns County Attorney's Office with a written demand that they return Mr. Larson's property immediately or provide me with a written explanation as to why they refused to do so. Because that determination was made, I believe, in 2013. So it's now been another three, three and a half years as to whatever it is that they continue to investigate um, involving Mr. Larson. Mr. Larson was let out after five days, and that's when the court realized there is literally not a shred of evidence to link Mr. Larson to this crime. 
Cold Spring is a small community, like I said, 4,000. Actually, I think technically the sign says 4,025. I don't want to misrepresent facts. Well, naturally, Mr. Larson, who had been living there for a long time, and I feel very comfortable walking around in the community when he was reading online death threats that were coming to, to him. Build a gallows. Get the lynch mob ready. I'll supply the rope. Put a full magazine in them. When the police chief reports that Mr. Larson should not come into town to get clothing, he needs an escort because he's not safe. That's no way to, to live, and that's no way an innocent person should have to live in their own community. Prior to his arrest, Mr. Larson was studying machine tool technology at St. Cloud Community College. He was doing well. He ended up pretty much failing out for a period of time. I'm happy to report that while two years late, he's now completed the degree. But it put a pause on his career for two years, and frankly, it's ended his career. Because now, in the age of the internet, in the age of social media, our reputations live on forever. Whatever happens to you, it's online. And it stays online. It stays online forever. What's the first thing an employer does? So you're all laughing. It's because you do it too. When you're going to do a story, you run them in the internet. You Google the name. Well, guess what comes up about Mr. Larson? He's a suspect in an ongoing investigation of a police murder. Can't get a job. Now he's forced for the last four or almost five years to work odd jobs so he can feed himself. And he can't pursue the career that he's been studying. On August 6, 2013, the Minnesota Department of Public Safety issued a press release. I'm sure you, you all have looked at the press release, but there were a couple of important things stated in that release. One is that the investigators had compiled evidence that would have resulted in Eric Joseph Thomas, I believe is how he pronounces his name, being arrested for the murder of Officer Tom Decker and Mr. Thomas not taking his own life on January 2nd, 2013. We know the tragic story. I have since received some information as to how and why Mr. Thomas was likely down there that night. Um, not clear that with my sources, I'm allowed to disclose all that yet. Um, but it, it's, it brought some clarity to this, but I know it's information that law enforcement knows, which makes it even more apparent that Mr. Larson, the focus should never have been on him. What's interesting is the press release also stated that the investigation has provided no information, not, not some information. The words no information were in the press release that Mr. Larson participated in Officer Decker's murder. There is no known connection, they said, no known connection between Mr. Thomas and Mr. Larson related to this crime. And yet, it was put in the press release that in discussions with the Stearns County Attorney, the BCA and Stearns County Sheriff's Office have been advised to leave the case open. Leave the case open. Almost four years has passed since that press release. The investigation is still open. Officer Decker's family deserves closure. They deserve to know the end of the story. They deserve to know that it really is over. That the individual who killed Officer Decker is deceased as well. And that Mr. Larson was wrongfully charged and that it's the end. And yes, if there was wrongdoing committed by investigators, which we know there was, from the misstatements and the lack of truthfulness in the affidavit of probable cause and the violations of civil rights just entering Mr. Larson's apartment to begin with that night, it's time to close the chapter and just make things as right as they can be. I have called on, I, I said in writing, and I, and I guess I do it again, to Stearns County to do the right thing here. Um, Mr. Larson's hurting, and I, I don't blame him. I mean, just to get him to come here and sit in front of all of you is difficult for him to do, because 
a lot of people still look at him as the cop killer and as somebody who eventually there's going to be a piece of information that, that comes out because that's the way Stearns County has portrayed him as a continuing person of interest. So I appreciate your reporting on this important story. Mr. Larson appreciates your reporting on this story. If you have any other questions, you have my contact information. I'm with uh, Jacob Litigation. It's a national law firm. It's on the internet, jacoblitigation.com. You can find me there. Um, but I also gave my cell phone to a few people. And be willing to keep in touch with anybody um, because, again, like Mr. Uh, Pat, or Attorney Patty, pardon me, um, I believe in keeping a good relationship with, with the media. You, you guys are, are a vital part of protecting citizens' rights. And um, the citizens deserve better here. And, and it's because of, of a lot of you, and a small part because of us, that um, we're headed in the right direction in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Jacob. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Rogers, could you give the uh, uh, contact information for TIPS, if you'd be kind enough, please? Yeah, my agency can be reached at tips at rstevenrogers.com. That's R-S-T-E-V-E-N-R-O-G-E-R-S.com. I will be handling the input of uh, tips and evidence and then forwarding them to Mr. Patton as necessary. These cases will be litigated separately. They have to be. They're, they're, uh, both Mr. Larson and Mr. Grass here I apologize, but naturally they can be witnesses in each other's cases. We think it's important that each case be litigated completely separately. So tips for the Waterland case should go to Mr. Patton and uh, to the detective at the end of the table. Um, tips for Mr. Larson's or any information you can help provide or something that I'm overlooking or just anything at all, however slight, um, should come my way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.